For generations, veterans have answered the call, some paying the ultimate sacrifice to maintain what many of us take for granted. This is Legacy Generations, and these are their stories. Today, I'm honored to introduce Gary Beard, our guest today. He is a uh, Vietnam veteran, and I'm, I'm super excited to hear, hear your experiences and uh, the, the, the things that you went through. So, okay. so welcome. So what years, what, what years did you actually serve? I went in over there in uh, the middle of April, and I come home right before Christmas, 1969, went over in 68 uh, in April, I think, and come home in November, I think, of 69. About a year yeah. and a half. Yeah, I extended to stay over there. Okay. Yeah. They had a program, which I've told you before, I, was, I had orders when I spent my year over there to come back to Port Carson, Colorado. And I thought, nah, I don't want to do that. They had this program going on. If you had a year to go or eight months to go in your, in your career, you could cut that in half by staying over there. So I, I took that option. Okay. Yeah, and big I mistake. Remind me, I can't remember, you were drafted, right? I volunteered for the volunteer. draft, okay. yeah. There was like six of us here in Marnesville running the group, about all the same age, and I was the youngest, and them five had already left, and I was Marnesville, nothing to do, so I might as well get this over with. <laughs> so I volunteered for the draft. So yeah, it seems yeah. like with a small community, there is several right. that I run into here in town that uh, yeah. Were, were there at the same time. So. And like I said, out in five, there's only like three of us maybe went to Vietnam, Beats and then went to Germany, which, you know, that, that wasn't their choice, but that's what happened. So okay. it worked out. And then what did you do? Uh, what was your primary job when you were in Vietnam? Uh, I was in a transportation company. It was the 8th Group, 54th Battalion, 669 Transportation Company. And uh, I started out as a cargo driver, driving five tons. We run convoys from Shrine Valley. That's down by Quinn Yon. That was our staging area. We went up... Uh, I think it's Highway 1 to Play Coup, and then there's Highway 9, went over to Bong Song, went up Anke Pass, Manyang Pass, and we delivered supplies on convoys. And then after, after I was there about six months, well, I had some seniority. I guess there is any seniority in the Army, but uh, there was a vacancy on the gun trucks, which escort the convoys, and that's a lot better than driving. I mean, you just ride until until it hits a fan, you know, so right. I got on the back of a gun truck, spent probably seven months on there, even after I put my extension. Then I got transferred to Korean Tiger Division as a radio operator. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, some of our conversations that we've had in the past, I just am enthralled by the experience that you had and uh, try to relate it to, because um, as you know, um, being uh, right. two two years in Afghanistan right. and uh, just going, I don't know if I can handle <laughs> handle what you guys handled in Vietnam. Well, the difference being Josh is in Vietnam, I think the average age was 19 or 20. Where the army you fight with today, they go up what 50 years old, some people like that. Plus, my theory is you guys have to fight a war and that's your pick with a rule book. In Vietnam, it was wide open. We made our own decisions and we lived by them. You know, we didn't. When you're out on convoy or out of that home base, the highest ranking person with you might be a second lieutenant. Nobody think brass come out of them gates. And uh, it's a bunch of buck sergeants and privates fighting the war. Yeah. And I, I you know, in our, in our conversations and then just the different vets that I've talked to over the years, uh, it seems to be, um, and, I, and I get this a lot from what our conversations, mm -hmm. is, is that you had to do what you did right. uh, because of the guys that were next to you in uniform. Right. Uh, right. It, it was, I don't know about today, but it was all, we were like all brothers. I mean, real brothers. I mean, we took care of each other. And, 
and uh, we knew who he was going out with every day and who he was going to be on the truck with every day. And yeah, we got to be real close. Yeah. And, and even more so with uh, the cultural differences, uh, you know, there was, especially during that time, um, there was certain, certain animosities and certain uh, uh, thoughts between different uh, groups of people. Right. And then, uh, right. you know, it, it, it didn't matter in the, in, when we were in country. So. No, it, once you landed over there and you got set in your company, I mean, it's basically whatever you wanted to do, do it, you know, stay alive and get the war over with, you know. There wasn't no rule book or nothing. Yeah. And then coming home, what was that? <laughs> that wasn't so good. <laughs> nah, it, when I come home, uh, I, I, I never left my mom and dad's house for a month. I never went outside. I basically, sleeping at night and walking around in the daytime looking out windows and stuff. My mom said, what is wrong with you? And I said, nothing. I'm just making sure nobody's sneaking up behind me, <laughs> right. you know. And, and nobody, you know, other than immediate family, nobody come to see me or nothing after I got home. Nobody cared about Vietnam guys when they come home. They heard all them terrible stories and everything, which they could be true. It didn't happen in our group, but but uh, no, I just didn't want to deal with the public. Right. And that's one reason I extended to stay over there. My mom and dad sent me a newspaper about twice a month and it was all about burning your draft card or going to Canada or protesting the war. And, and when it come time for me to, my year was up, I said, I don't really want to go back to that. I'll just, I got my own family here now. Right. So I stayed. So yeah, that's, uh, and, and as we uh, keep talking, I, I just want to one thank you again for for this opportunity, and it's uh, it is an honor. And one of the uh, one of the ways that we got started in doing this project is is uh, you know my grandfather was a World War II vet, and then as he got older and his memory started to to slide, we weren't able to record his time, and so and my. My thoughts on that have all changed here as I've gotten older. Uh, for the last, say, 20 years, the history class out here at school, I can't think of the teacher's name, but she was, she was real interested in the Vietnam War. And she would pick out certain guys in this area and have the kids two or three at a time go interview you. And for a long time, I said, I ain't got nothing to tell you. I mean, you, nobody want to talk to me when I come home. I don't want to talk to anybody now. But as I get older and realize that if us veterans don't tell the story, you ain't gonna know the real story. Right. So for the last eight, nine years, why, well, yeah, they come and I talk to them. Right. But somebody needs to know our side of it. Right. Yeah. And that's, uh, that, that is a very, I think that's something that has trans, that, that, carries through all the different generations right. um, and, and but the general public doesn't understand the the, the experiences that we went through but right. a, a veteran of your generation and a veteran of my generation that's you know anybody that's put on the uniform right. has a different perspective and the thing that I've always said that, that you've been out of country I've been out of country and everything these people in the United States don't know how the countries live. I mean, it's, they, they get upset about something that don't work around the house or nothing, and that ain't a problem. Them people over there, they've got it tough. I mean, in third world countries, you just don't realize how them people live. We've got it very good in this country, yeah. Yeah, and we treat, we treat them people good. We, we gave them food old clothing that we didn't use or nothing, especially the kids along the roads when the convoy is all standing there hollering chop chop, well that's food, and we'd throw them the sea rations, you know, and stuff, and yeah, them countries, them people don't have much. Right. Yeah. So, one of the things that, uh, being in Afghanistan, you know, we had a, we had an enemy, but we didn't know who they were because they weren't uniformed, they, right. you know, and very often the the person we were buying bread or buying uh, exactly. a, a coke from yeah. uh, you know we, we said 
we said the same thing in Vietnam and farmers out there in them rice paddies, they'd all all wave to you, you know, and GI number one and everything in the daytime and at night they'd try to shoot you, you know. I mean you don't you know but that poor if you ain't in a uniform, you don't know the good guy guy from the bad guy. Right. Yeah. But yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Um I, I, and I, I'm sure with those experiences in the brotherhood that you uh, developed while you're there that you could rattle off everybody that was, was there. And is there, is there any people that have really stuck with you over the years? That there's, you... uh, there's two from this area, John Crassination. He was a motor pool sergeant when we come in every night and the head, head of the guys who worked on the trucks and restocked the ammo and everything. He's from Streeter, Streeter, Illinois. I've been in touch with him. And then Troy Coos, or Daryl Coos from Troy, Missouri. He was in the transportation company with me, and he got shot through the shoulder. And he come home. He'd only been there about six months, but we were real close. If you can find somebody in your area, you know, deal. You always say, "Where are you from?" You know, <laughs> Illinois. Where at? You know, and uh, you really tightened up with them guys because it was neat to have somebody that knew where you was from and everything. But yeah, and then on the gun truck, uh, our driver, his name was Johnny Angel. I'll never forget the first time he told me his name. Oh yeah, right. Uh, he was from Dunkirk, Indiana. Ed Murray, the the sergeant of the gun truck, was from uh, California, I can't remember where. And a real good friend of mine, Andy Matkin, was from uh, Warner Robins, Georgia. He was the six. He was a fifty man, and then uh, when he got ready to come home, well, I moved up to the fifty, and he ran the sixty, and we were real close. And he died of cancer probably six, seven years ago now. Right. Yeah, but the four that you rode with every day, and they were they were like brothers. Yeah, yeah. So what? Uh, what was some of the experiences and the uh, lasting experiences that you were uh, running up and down the uh, supply route? I'll briefly tell you, well, there's a staging area. There's a night crew that loaded the trucks. They took them 20 at a time to coin the on and back. And I got on that detail for a couple months because it was a lot cooler at night. And uh, everybody wanted to work nights because it was only about 80, 85 degrees out in the daytime. It was 100, 110. So we took nights. but. Night convoy is, you don't run with headlights, the, what they call them, cat eyes, you follow the lead jeep has the headlights and then everybody else follows the cat eyes in front of you on the tail lights. Took 20 trucks at a time, because you didn't want to lose over 20. Right. Wide open all the way to Quinion, they'd load them wide open back, park them, grab another 20. Had one gun truck with us, brought up the rear and the lead, and the lead jeep. And over, I don't know how it is in Afghanistan, but at night they'd close all the bridges in Vietnam. They'd drag Constantina wire across and bridges closed. So you had to radio ahead and tell them to open up the bridge because here we come, fast we can go. And the only, the only real problem we had one night, I don't know where the Vietcong just didn't have nothing to do or something, but they threw everything they had at us. And of course they knocked out the lead jeep and uh, Always carried a camera with you in your truck, day and night. You never know what you might get a picture of. I had a camera and N16 in the truck with me. Convoy come to stop, and they were on both sides. It was just rattling us with machine gun fire. So smart thing to do is get out of your truck, because uh, the convoy trucks ain't armor plated or nothing. So I got out of the truck, and it got pretty hot right there as I at. So I got underneath the truck. Bullets still bouncing around, so I crawled up on top of the rear axles between it and the bed about that far. <laughs> I got up in there, I thought, I got to get somewhere. Right. And uh, after they'd hammered us for what seemed like eternity, probably 20 minutes, why nobody said nothing. You could hear them, they come up and start going through the trucks, spraying machine gun fire in trucks, and they stole my camera, stole my M16. I could have reached out and slapped them on their feet. They was right there, but they looked under the truck, but they didn't see me. A lot of guys took to the ditch, and some of them that was a good idea, and some of them wasn't. But after we heard them leave and go back in the jungle, while well, we started hollering, you know, hey, anybody alive? You know, and we finally all got back together. But uh, 
I think out of 20, we only lost five drivers that night. Mm -hmm. But uh, they were right there. I could have shook hands with them. Wow. And, I was, and I was only weighed like 135 pounds, so I got up on top of them axles and I hit up there, but there wasn't no place to go, you know. And of a night, you didn't call out for air support. I mean, choppers didn't fly the night over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's often uh, when we talk about the Vietnam War that, you know, we own, we own the day, but they own the night. And, exactly, and so, exactly. Yeah, uh, and then on your day convoys, there'd be 100 trucks to a convoy, be the lead Jeep, 10 trucks, gun truck, 10 trucks, gun truck. There might be nine or 10 gun trucks to a convoy. And of course, the convoy spread out, supposed to keep 50 yards between trucks, so if that one blowed up, yours didn't. And uh, they would, a lot of sniper fire on daytime, because a lot of times we had air support, we had Cobras and Hueys flying above us, but every now and then they'd get brave and throw a lot at us, but uh, whenever the convoy stopped, the idea was wherever they hit you in that convoy, them cargo trucks supposed to keep going, get out of the way, if you're in front of it, the back stopped, then all the gun trucks pulled out and come up to the hot spot. So we might have six or seven gun trucks throwing back at them, you know. When they got tired of it, why? Then we reformed and took off again. But convoy, we left like daylight, and to go to play coup, you had to go up Man Yang Pass. It's a terrible pass. I got pictures of it, I'll show you, but. It was just down there straight up for seven miles, and them old trucks would be getting hot, and you'd have two or three trucks bumper to bumper pushing the lead truck, you know, to get him over the top. And you're pretty much sitting ducks on that. That's when we really paid attention to what was going on. But uh, uh, you'd get home right, right about dark. It took all day to do it. You'd done that seven days a week. Wow. Yeah. And were you moving food and supplies? or? Yeah, anything. Or? We moved. Might be a whole convoy of uh, artillery rounds, might be a whole convoy of beer, might be a whole convoy of boots, <laughs> food, yeah, sea rations. You, you just didn't know until you went down there in the morning to see what they loaded on the trucks at night. But usually on your, on your convoys when you was hauling ammo and stuff like that, we had a lot of air support. But if we had 100 truckloads of beer or soda pop, why well, wasn't so much air support, right. they needed them somewhere else. Yeah. But every day, yeah, you, you got, you, you're supposed to get one day off a week, but we short a man, and we usually work seven days a week. And then that one day that you got off, when you did get it off, you stayed back at the compound, but you had to pull guard of a night, so you really didn't have a day off. Yeah, and I'm, since you got off guard duty, then you went and got on the convoy. I imagine you guys spent a lot of time working on your vehicles. And Every night when you come in, the road's so dusty and dirty, you had to loan, unload your 50s, your 60s, take them in and clean them every night. Right. Yeah. The ammo and everything stayed on the trucks, but but yeah, the guns come off. Yeah. So what, what rank were you when you... I was a private first class when I went over, and then about everybody over and made buck sergeant. Okay. Sergeant E5, and then when you made buck sergeant for some kind of a gift or something, you got to wear a 45 automatic pistol, which was junk. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time we was in a convoy, and, and we were all E5s on the truck, all four of us, and we'd throw about everything we had at him out there in the jungle. And somebody said, let's shoot our 45s at him. <laughs> I thought, really? <laughs> so we were shooting out them little holes inside the truck, them 45s. We couldn't even tell where we were hitting, you know, they were wore out. Wow. But uh, I took that back in to the arms room, and over there the arms room was like a candy store. They had about every weapon that was ever used in a war in there, and you just went in and picked one out, and they signed for it, and you took it. So I traded that 45 in for an M79 grenade launcher, and uh, you knew where you was hitting when you fired that thing. Right. Yeah. I fired everything I could get my hands on. I fired a grease gun, them old things. Fired a carry to Thompson on that gun truck for a while. The only thing they'd never had in that arms room was a BAR, Browning Automatic Rifle. I always wanted to shoot one of them, but they never did get one in. So, wow. yeah, it was neat. Yeah, yeah. Time, times have changed because yeah. it's you know, yeah. here, here. Here's your primary, and this here's is yeah, this is what you <laughs> what you're assigned to, and you're certified on and <laughs> trained on. But uh, yeah, that uh, I think for the machine guns we carried. Probably 
2,000 rounds of ammo for your 50 and probably about the same for your 60s. And they thought, and them cans of ammo take up a lot of room back at truck. Right. So once you got in there and got in your position, that's basically where you sat all day. There wasn't much room to move. Do you have any opportunities or any uh, times that you went through all that ammo in, in yeah, a day? Yeah, yeah. And pictures I showed, we went through a lot of it. But the good thing about it, like I said, is when, when the convoy got hit and got stopped, all the gun trucks come together, you know. So if you got some hot dog on one that just kept shooting and shooting. Of course, on them 50s, the barrels get red hot. After a while, we carried great big asbestos gloves and screwed them barrels off and we carried extra barrels for it. Otherwise, them bullets just go everywhere. But uh, yeah, we, we got low on ammo, but usually by the time, they didn't, it wasn't a, like an all day battle. They'd hit and run, you know. We tried to burn up as much as we could. We <laughs> might get lucky and hit somebody. <laughs> oh, yeah. So how many of, how many stories do you think you, you know, with your grandkids uh, or things that you've shared? Because I know age dependent and stuff, but yeah. uh, you know, there, there's stuff that I'm sure. I don't really know. talk too much about it. My grandson, my youngest grandson, he's all army and all guns and everything. We've talked quite a bit, but he's only nine years old. My oldest grandson, he's 24. And I don't think I've ever said a word to him about Vietnam. And then my oldest daughter, lives in Florida, she's always asked me about Vietnam, and I said, ah, there wasn't much to it. That's about all I've ever told them. <laughs> but I've kind of, like you said, get older, I've loosened up a lot. Right. But uh, a lot of people would stop and say, hey, how was it over there? And of course, you're still carrying a chip on your shoulder, you know. If you want to know, go over, you know, it's still fighting. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, well, if there's something, if there's a message that you, you know, would like to leave them. Um... The thing, well, there's another part of it, too, when I got assigned to the Korean Tiger Division as a radio operator, my second tour of duty, I call it. The Koreans were there till the war was over. I told you this. My translator was a guy named Sergeant Park. And I asked him one day, and and of course we was on foot then, we was out on patrol, and they, Koreans are mean people. They, they basically shot about anything that moved, you know. And I asked him one day, I said, why do we shoot everybody? And he said, if we can kill everybody in this country, we get to go home. You Americans go home after a year. We're stuck here. He, he was married and had three kids. He lived in Seoul, Korea, and he'd been there three years and he hadn't seen his family. He was there till it was over. So our theory is, as soon as we kill everybody, game's over. And that was a, I wish I'd, if I'd known when I signed that paper to stay on where I was going to end up, I would have come home because when you go out on patrol, the medic and the radio operator bring up the rear because they don't want them shot first. And you walked over everything that they shot or destroyed. And it was a lot different riding in the back of that gun truck. Right. Yeah. It was, it was, it, there's only two times you're scared when you get in country. That's when you first get there and when you're getting ready to go home. <laughs> but in between, it kind of got like a job, you know. You got used to it. And you knew you had these boys here with you to come take care of you. So, yeah. Yeah, I can, uh, I can attest to that because it was, that was one of the things leaving Afghanistan the first time right. when they said, oh, we're leaving on this date. And I was just like, oh don't tell God. me the date. I don't want to know. Uh, <laughs> let's just do our job. So. All I got to do is live till that date. You get up at night and go to the train. You put on your flat jacket, your steel pot and everything because you didn't want to die when you was going to come home. Yeah. What were the, what were the barracks conditions? And how, they were good. Just, we had... We had wooden barracks, two-story, had a, had a uh, big motor pool down on one end and, and then had your uh, mess hall and everything up there and had house girls. They got a dollar a day. They come in, clean the barracks, wash your clothes and everything. Yeah, it was, it was good living conditions. Now when I got assigned with the Koreans, that all went south. <laughs> yeah, they, don't, they didn't live as good as we did. And of course, the food they eat, to me, was terrible. It was, little fish with the eyes in them and rice and kimchi and 
it, it was a bad experience. Mm. I wish to hell I'd never signed that paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever, it all worked out. The thing that I always told them high school kids when they come to interview me, they said, what's, what's one thing you'd like to leave us with before we get done talking to you? And I said, I want to tell you straight up, and I'm 100% I'm American, but everything your government tells you is not true. <laughs> yeah, they have a tendency to cover up a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of stuff that, that uh, happened in Vietnam that, that to me shouldn't have happened because somebody on the other side knew what was going on or somebody on our side didn't care what you was doing. So, uh, yeah, the government don't always tell you the truth. I, th I you know, uh, personally, I, th I think there, uh, it was the Vietnam vets had a whole different perspective than the vets of my generation, because you know it was basically a two-front war, because you had the the right. protests and right. the anti-war right. stuff going on here. And, and I'm thinking it's getting that way more. You guys fight now. There's no front line. You fight for this piece of ground for two days, and then you say, well, we're out of here. Two days later, the enemy's back in it. Right. And there's no, they can't, when you leave a morning on convoy, you can't really say, well, all the action's way over in this part of the country. It was everywhere. You just didn't know who to trust. Yeah, but uh, yeah. One thing that really comes to my mind, and I've talked to you about this before, is. Uh, equipment you guys carry when you're over I've seen you know on the news and everything how in the hell or why did you carry all that stuff with you all you need is a gun a canteen of water and ammo but you guys got cameras you got to be hot yeah, well, yeah, and terrible it gets a little hot and you got the the plates and you know right. so there's quite a bit of weight and they can't understand why we all have bad backs and uh, <laughs> so yeah well yeah. like I can say in Vietnam is about Average age is 19, and Buck Sergeant's your CO when you're out the gate. And we wore boots, pants, usually didn't have a shirt, flat jacket on, and didn't often put a helmet on until it started getting shot at, you know. It worked, yeah. So, so Highway 1 and Highway 9 were your primary routes. Right. Uh, right. Did they parallel or cross They over? split. You got out of... You got out of Quinion was below us, Shrang Valley's about about seven mile out there where we were at. And right right before we got the two highways run together out of Quinion and one split and one up the coast and then the other went up the mountains. I can't remember which is which. But on Manyang Pass, that that pass was terrible too. It took a long time to get up it. <coughs> Excuse me. About right at the top. Off to the right was this great big, looked like a 10 acre checkerboard. It was white squares and grass or jungle, white squares. And back in the uh, 40s, the French were fighting over there in that war. And they got ambushed on that pass. They, they had a big battle somewhere and they were coming back down that pass. And uh, didn't have maybe 100 rounds of ammo between five, 600 guys. And they got ambushed. And, they basically got wiped out, and what they done is they dug holes and stood them guys up in the ground facing France and then poured lime over them, and that was the white part you seen. And uh, that, that pass there was terrible. It was worse than Ann K Pass because it was, the vegetation was growed up along the road so bad, and it was just miles straight up and around. Manyang Pass is a good place to keep your eyes open. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, did, the, did those parallel, or did the, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was across the border, did it? We never, I don't really know, we never got into that. It was probably there, but we never, at that time, we didn't know where it was at. And, and uh, it might have been next to them, I don't know, but I think it was farther north of us. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, just their network. Yeah, it's yes. just... It's amazing how much supplies and they could move and not be seen. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that Agent Orange, they've sprayed that, that 24D brush killer. The purpose of that on them roads was they'd spray that from the road back about a mile and kill all the vegetation so they couldn't get right up in your face, you know. 
And it worked. I mean, that stuff was bad. It just killed everything. You could see, and that's the reason they sprayed it. And, and it was, it worked what to use it for, but then they found out later it wasn't a good idea. You know, everybody's affected by it now. Yeah, but, yeah, they, and I don't know, the, the, it's a better job being on them gun trucks or in that convoy would be out there walking through the mud all day, you know, so. It's probably one of the better jobs over there. Uh, so you were fairly young when you did go to... Uh, uh, 18 when I went in. Okay. Yeah, and I remember, uh, one of the things I remember, one one horse town here had one tavern, <laughs> and I was probably a couple weeks before I had to go to the Army and knew Novus around it, and I said, hey, how about a beer? And he said, you're not old enough. And I said, I'm going to Vietnam. He said, I don't care if I serve you, your parents are going to find out. I thought, you, are you kidding me? But uh, when you got to Vietnam, they, uh, you could drink beer over there. They didn't care how old you was. Right. Yeah. But yeah, as far as being scared or anything, I wasn't, wasn't really scared and it really didn't dawn on me until you actually step off the plane over there and, and uh, see what's going on. And then you got a little, a little, excited but two things about stepping off that plane i remember the most is the heat and the smell of that country it was terrible mm. yeah but like i say after you're over a month or two you just settled into a routine right. yeah and your people my aunts and uncles mom and dad write me you know what you're doing what you're doing and it's just basically the same thing every day, and I didn't tell them too much. I send pictures of the scenery and stuff. As far as what I'm doing, well, don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, did it and coming coming home because uh, you were talked earlier about how you would walk around the house and make sure nobody's, you know. Um, it, I tell you a story about coming home. Flew to. Japan and then to Alaska and then down to San Francisco and then to St. Louis and that's where my mom died. And I was walking around in the airport at St. Louis and they give you grass greens and everything, you know. And uh, I just spent a year and five months, six months in Vietnam and uh, already out of the army. And I was walking around the airport and MPs was all over, you know. And, one walked up to me and he said, get your hat on, soldier. I thought, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> so I put my hat on. I thought, when's this end? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even wear a steel pot half the time. I don't have to have a damn hat on here in St. Louis. But that's the Army for you. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it was funny. I, uh, I've heard stories uh, from other Vietnam vets that when they'd fly into San Francisco, mm -hmm. that they would tell, uh, tell them, hey, you know, Put on civilian tie, civilian clothes. Don't walk around in uniform. Yeah. And, yeah, and then while you were waiting to go to Vietnam, after you got your orders to go, they took you to San Francisco. This great big air base, I guess, big big Quonsets had about 500 old steel bunks in them. That's where you waited with your duffel bag to be called out to go to Vietnam. And you might be there two or three days, and they had you out police in the area picking up <laughs> cigarette butts and stuff before you went to Vietnam. I thought, really. Okay. <laughs> Some things never change. Yeah. Uh, more of a personal question. Um, you know, we we talk about uh, and today the PTSD is a mm -hmm. is a is a big mm -hmm. um, term that's mm -hmm. used. Right. I forget what there was a term that they used. Uh, a delayed onset. Um, and so you know, sleep was mm -hmm. altered and right. nightmares and right. stuff and. Um, do you, did you have any of that or had yeah, to do? Yeah, I, I get compensated for PTSD, it ain't much, but, but uh, uh, they always ask you when you go to the VA clinic, you know, and everything, you have plashbacks and everything, as you get older you don't really have plashbacks. There's a lot of things this day and age that I will not do uh, because of Vietnam. If we go out to eat in a restaurant, I won't eat in a booth where somebody's behind me. I want against the wall where I can see everybody. And I don't, if we're standing somewhere in a crowd, I'll be in back of the crowd because I don't want nobody <laughs> standing behind me. And that's just to carry old Vietnam. 
But uh, yeah, and then the age of orange factors finally caught up with me. I've told you I've been diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease now. And that's all part of Vietnam, but what are you gonna do about it? Not live with it, yeah. But no, nah, that, I get a little jumpy sometimes when I get in the crowd. I don't, I usually tend to see I don't get in crowds. Yeah, it's just one of those things that I don't want nobody to stand behind me. Yeah. I know, uh, you know, myself and some friends that uh, it, it, there's certain noises and certain, for me, um, you know, I was a medic in Afghanistan, and there's certain smells mm -hmm. that just bring back right. those bad, uh, right. bad situations that we were in. And every now and then, this area, not so much. You know, a, a army Huey will fly over or something. I'll hear it coming, <laughs> and that'll bring back memories. Yeah, you once you hear a helicopter go right. through there, you never forget that sound. And there were thousands of them over there. Oh, I bet you yeah. got uh, very right. familiar and identify, <laughs> oh, that's a Huey flying over. Yeah. That's a... Cobra's a little different. They're a little more faster and quieter, but them Hueys and then them Chinooks, you can always tell when them's coming. They use them around here to check the levees on the river and stuff. I can always tell one of them's in the area. Right. Yeah. Hmm. I always run outside or look and see what the hell it is, why, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I figure they're covering me. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're, they, they stay busy, so uh, yeah. we, we see them quite a bit. And then uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still curious, um, e your gun trucks each had a mm -hmm. name, um, mm -hmm. you know. And, yeah. And, and, yeah. I rode uh, the Hawk for a while. I did spend some time on King Kong. And then another one I rode for a short term was called Cold Sweat. And then we had Eva Destruction, Devil's Workshop, Iron Butterfly. They've actually made two books on the gun trucks of Vietnam. I forgot to bring mine, but I'm in one of them, riding oh. on the riding on the Hawk. Oh yeah. Yeah, it says Gary Beard from Illinois underneath it. I would love to. Yeah, see they're that. hardback books. They're really neat books. They've got every gun truck. A lot of your gun trucks were two and a half tons. We carried fives, but uh, later on. When I was getting ready to get out, while well, we got many guns mounted on the back of them, they were bad. <laughs> we had one truck that had a quad 50s on it and aircraft guns. <laughs> that was how they. The black market in Vietnam was crazy. If you if you had something in your company, say you had a truckload of pallets of pop or beer that got damaged, and they brought it back. You could go to another company that was in some other business and trade that whatever they had. And somebody in our company traded a half a truck load of beer for a anti-aircraft gun. <laughs> Drug it back on a flatbed. Took about a month to get it mounted up on that five ton. It was bad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, and, and it's funny how uh, the experiences or the uh the talents of the people around who's yes, i'm sure you yes. could find it would, didn't take you long to find a welder or oh, uh, some farmer yes. and say uh, they could fix anything in that motor pool and like i said all them trucks were painted up had names on there's an artist in every one of them companies yeah now i'll give you them gun truck books you'll love them okay. there's some bad trucks in there mm -hmm. yeah and that you were telling me one's actually in a museum? Yes, the only one that come back in Vietnam is Eva Destruction. And it tells in that book where it's at, there's an army museum maybe in one of the Carolinas or maybe around Washington, but they've got pictures of loading that truck up in Vietnam, got all the machine guns, ammo, everything on it. And that's why it's sitting in that museum. They just wow. loaded it up and brought it home. But there were hundreds if not thousands of gun trucks over there and when we little quit that war while we just walked off and the enemy got everything. Tanks, never brought none of that stuff on. None of it. Yeah. Amazing. You know, you you shared the story about when you were mm -hmm. uh, your convoy was being attacked and you actually crawled up on top of the, mm -hmm. the axle and was hiding. Um, you know, is there any other situation? When, uh, where... when I was still driving a cargo truck, why well, every hour the convoy would stop and give you a 10 minute break, get out of your truck, stretch your legs, get a drink of water, whatever. And usually, you're supposed to stay so far apart, but usually the convoy would bunch up and you'd talk to the rest of the guys, you know. And one day I'd stand there talking to this, this kid. I'd been there probably five months and 
he was a new guy, I don't even know his name, but we were leaning up against the side of one of the trucks talking, you know, and all of a sudden he just dropped. I thought he fainted from the heat, you know, but uh, I didn't hear a shot. He didn't hear a shot, but I got to look at him. It looked like somebody took a drill bit and drilled a hole right above his nose and his forehead. So I got down and I know Danny had been shot and rolled him over in the back of his head gone. A sniper somewhere out in that jungle decided, you know, he's going to sight any his weapon for the day, pick the guy out. And we were standing shoulder to shoulder. And that sniper picked that guy. Wow. I just stood there for a long time after that when the medics come up, you know, and of course the convoy stopped then because you got to find another guy to drive that truck to get out of there. And of course I had to look, call in Chopper and get him out of there. But I stood there for a long time just shaking. I thought, that's pretty damn close, you know. It was just one of those things, yeah. And then a lot of times in, the, in your convoy when you'd, when you'd start catching the, catching the attack or, or getting hammered on, you know, uh, and you're getting short of ammo, you're always thinking, is this going to end, you know? And of course, around the 50 while you're standing up above that armored wall. And, and you, that one day when I got pictures, boy, they were bouncing lead off the side of that truck everywhere. And I don't know how it didn't keep from getting shot. I mean, you're, the wall's this tall and you're standing up another three foot. Yeah, I mean, and you didn't really think about, you know, I got to get down because your, your job is to run that machine gun. So you just stayed up there with it. But uh, boy, one day they really beat us to death. Man, you were above that wall because you're fairly, you're right. fairly tall Six and then five. you had all that, that yeah. brass. Right. What, what was... And it kept building up and finally uh, Ed, Ed Murray, the, we always carried a scoop show on the truck. He hollered at me and he said, you need to get down lower. And I said, I can't. He started scooping the brass out from underneath me and throwing it over the side of the truck. Well, that lowered me down six, eight inches, you know. Wow. But uh, there's a couple of times we about burned up all the ammo we had. Yeah. But uh, you basically, it wasn't like you seen a whole wall of Viet Cong out there shooting at you. They were hid in the brush. You just, you had to try to catch sight where the it was coming from and then just, kind of just try to level that area and then find another spot you think it's coming from yeah. and hope you're doing some good. And we did because when you'd come back on the convoy that night or if he was going in and then you went out the next morning, the, the regular army patrol, the grunts or whatever they call them, they'd drag them out, lay them alongside the road so you'd get a count. He was actually doing some good. I remember one time we got caught out there. If you got caught out there the night, say a truck broke down, and the wrecker had already got a hold of a truck. You had to leave that truck out there. Well, a gun truck had to stay with it all night long. And we was at an Air Force base over around Phuket. And something happened to that truck. And so we were sitting there and finally old Ed Murray, before it got dark, he said, you know, we ain't sitting out here all night. We're going to get killed. He said, Phuket's just right down the road. Get that driver in for us and this gun truck and we'll go down to Phuket and spend the night. My truck's here in the morning, five and eight, who cares? So uh, we went down there and we pulled up to the gate, that big Air Force base, and the gate guard told him what was going on, said, we're stuck out here for the night, wanted to know if we'd come in. He said, yeah, he said, you guys can come in, but you can't bring that gun truck in here because it's got live ammo on it. And uh, we said, what about our M16s? He said, you'll have to leave them on the truck. And we thought, dude, there's a war going on right just <laughs> down the road here. So we put everything in the truck, parked there by the gate, and went in there. They had potato chips, they had ice cream, which we hadn't seen for a year. They had tennis courts. It was crazy. Wow. And then right outside the gate, 100 yards, you were back to good old war. Wow. Yeah, wouldn't let us bring that gun truck in there because hmm. they had live ammo hot. We ain't going in about it. <laughs> we did. We slept right in by probably 40 feet from it. We was on the inside and the truck sat on the outside. Right. Yeah. And so you had, you had the M16, uh, which would have been the A1 at the yeah, time. Yeah, we so. all carried M16s, even though we fired machine guns. You signed one when you got there and checked it back in when you left. 
And it's up to you. You could leave it in your locker if you wanted to. Right. If you didn't plan on getting out and running after somebody. Well, that was a fairly new rifle because yes. uh, when you would have yeah. you would have used probably the M14 when you went to basic. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and we called them the Mattel toy company rifles because they were plastic and they weren't very accurate and they didn't work good in dust or mud or water or dirt. Right. They jam. We didn't rely on them very much. Right. Yeah, but, uh, we usually didn't even take them with us. <laughs> they've improved over the years. Good. Just, I'm glad uh, to hear yeah, that. But, uh, <laughs> But that M14, that's a bad gun. That's a good one to have, yeah. And that reached out there. And some of your snipers in Vietnam had M14s. The biggest part of our guys carried the uh, Remington 700s. Yeah. But that M14, if, if you had access to one and you got tired of that Mattel toy gun and you wanted to reach out and touch somebody, you can go to the arms room and get one of them 14s. It'd definitely let you know he's in the neighborhood. Yeah. But now it just got to be routine after a while. Right. Some people would say, how in the hell fighting the war can be routine? But you get in a routine of staying alive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, do what you got to do. Yeah. And uh, coming home, I know, uh, you know, being around other vets, local, local vets, and then... Uh, you know, being active in, yeah. the, I know you're active in the American Legion and the local BFWs and, um, you know, what, uh, what does that camaraderie still, how does yeah. that help you or affect yeah, you? Yeah, I, I enjoy sitting down talking to guys and of course, uh, a lot of guys and I'm the same way, you won't get into the blood and guts part of it very much, but yeah, just talking about where you's at and what you done and what you seen and stuff like that, I enjoy that. but. But before we wrap this up, I want, I want to tell you something that people in life don't consider is decisions you make, how you think it might be good for you, but for somebody else it's not. When I decided to stay over there, I didn't write my folks that I was, wasn't coming home. I made the decision to stay over there. Well, they thought I was coming home four months before that, and finally, I wrote them and told them, and uh, my mom, my brothers told me she she lost it. She mm -hmm. <laughs> she couldn't handle it. And uh, when I got home, well, of course everything's better. But she said, "Why did you do that?" And I said, "Well, at the time I thought it was a good deal. I didn't know it was going to affect you people any, right. and it did. She she never got over that. She couldn't understand why I wouldn't come home. Right. It's just one of those things that I didn't want to come home." So whenever you make a decision that thinks this is going to be good for me, you might think about what it does to somebody else before you make it. <laughs> Sometimes it ain't good for other people. No, that's absolutely yeah. true. So. Yeah. And, uh, family, uh, you know, because we talk about generations mm -hmm. and the legacies. Um, mm -hmm. um, you're not the first generation or the first family member to, no, to serve. So. No, I had a lot of cousins. It was in the army and uh, a lot of, there was 14 kids in my dad's family. And uh, I think it was, no, there was 10 kids. And I think uh, five boys, I think four of them fought in World War II. Yeah, and then I had one uncle, the youngest boy in dad's family, his brother, he fought in World War I, Uncle Russell Beard. Yeah, so the Beards have been in the war. And of course, my cousin, Gerald Beard, he was in World War II. He 91, comes down here on Memorial Day. Yeah, he was in that one. But uh, no, nah, my brother lives here in town, my younger brother David. Uh, he's always wanted to look at my pictures and stuff, and I've, I've never shown them to him. <laughs> wow. I just don't drag them out and show them to everybody. I thought, you know, certain people back in, they didn't want to have nothing to do with you, and to this day, I still don't have nothing do with other people well and I tell you when I when we were talking the other day and I uh, asked you to find some uh, uh, pictures mm -hmm. and I was excited because yeah. some of the other guys that I've talked to right. are like oh I wish I, I wish I had a picture of this story yeah. you know or yeah. whatever and um, you know and they're like yeah. oh I 
burned them or they've, well, they've got mom got rid of them when I moved out of the house or whatever. They, I used so. to have a lot of pictures, but when I got a divorce, my ex-wife got rid of a lot of them <laughs> pictures for me. And another thing I'd done when I come home, which was stupid, I wish I'd kept it, kept them, but all your jungle fatigues and, and everything you had as far as clothing, you got to put in a foot locker and ship it home. Um, after I started coming out of the house, after about a month, I burned them all. I went out in the backyard of the house. We had a garden. I burned them. I didn't want anybody to know I was in Vietnam. I saved a field jacket and one, one shirt. Why didn't you want people to know you were in Vietnam? Just didn't want to be involved with them. I didn't. The people back then, that Vietnam War was not a good thing. I mean, people hated that war and they basically hated anybody that fought in it. Mm. Yeah, and I didn't want anybody to know I was in Vietnam. Yeah. yeah that's, uh, I would say that's a, diff a huge contrast between the Vietnam veterans and then the veterans of today. Right. You right. know, uh, I've been right. in the airport uh, right. flying and a right. soldier or a marine will get off the airplane and people start clapping and right. Um, right. it's kind of died right. down here in the last yeah. couple of years but and another thing that i've got two or three hats that says vietnam better you know and i'll wear one every now and then but i don't really want to wear them like go jackson or somewhere i don't want anybody to wear no i was in vietnam mm. i don't really care whether they know or not right. <laughs> one of those things you know, which guy ought to be proud he fought for his country, you know, but the other side of the coin back then, nobody gave a damn if he fought for Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that has a lot to do with the, the people didn't know why we were fighting. Exactly, and then, and then what little media was over there, they just blowed everything out of proportion and stuff, and, and if the, if, the media knew what really went on over there. <laughs> no, they wouldn't like it. But you had to do what you did to stay alive. I mean, it wasn't a walk in the park. Yeah. No. Yeah, when World War II and them wars over, had parades and everybody, it was great. Never had a parade for Vietnam guys that I know of. No, and I, that's one thing that's, uh, I guess I just said my dad was a Vietnam vet, and there's one thing that I wish that they would do is just, you know, whether it's D.C. or Times Square or something, and actually have exactly. it, get just all the Vietnam one vets time. In, yep, That's and, all it takes, one time. Good, so. But whatever. All right. So. <laughs> they wait long enough, there'll only be one guy in the parade. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a very sad uh, fact. So, um, so you, you had said... Uh, the the Agent Orange and, mm -hmm. and then the, the, how it's affecting you now um, is that uh, something that the VA is starting to recognize that I think the I think the the VA is putting up pressure on the government the government's starting to recognize you know first they first they said well it might might cause this or might cause it now there's 14 different different diseases or or problems, health problems that it does cause, and there's there's a couple more they're working on. They're going to slide in there too. But the problem of it is, us guys are getting older, and I mean, what little help they can give us, I'll take it. But it's too little, too late. Right. Yeah, a lot of guys that died of that stuff that they didn't even know why they died 20 years ago, but now they know. Yeah, yeah. Oh well. Yeah, it's, and it, and it's tough to to face that and then still be, you know, I, I do it all over again oh. mentality. So yeah, um, I if I could go back to Vietnam today with the same group of guys, I'd fight her again. Yeah, yeah, it uh, it was a tough deal, but it was a learning experience. Yeah.